Welcome, Jason, to Wellness Spring. It's so lovely to have you on the show. It's great to be with you, Beverly. Thanks for um, uh, thanks for asking me to do this. It's um, yeah, it's it's a great pleasure. Yeah, and it was such a pleasure for me to meet you in person in your lovely St. Giles Parish Church, which is um, an icon, I believe. Yeah, it's um, it's right at the centre of uh, Wrexham, which is a town that's a city uh, that has now become uh, famous across the world from Welcome to Wrexham. And uh, we get lots of really interesting people coming through. And uh, one of the things I really enjoy doing is to just to stop and um, say hello to people. And uh, sometimes we have very superficial conversations uh, and sometimes we have actually uh, quite in-depth conversations and uh, sometimes you can meet really, really interesting people. And of course, you're one of them. So yeah, uh, thanks Thank for coming. Thank you. And it was, um, yeah, very interesting because um, well, while we were chatting, mm -hmm. you happened to mention about... Um, your church and yourself being part of the Welcome to Wrexham show. So you've actually been living in Wrexham while history has taken place with the two actors buying the team. How has that affected one, your church and the congregation and the whole town of Wrexham? Yeah, it's given the, the whole place a lot more confidence, really. So um, people people locally thought that it was a bit run down and uh, that it was a bit of a joke, really. And, um, you know, why would anyone want to come here? And now, actually, even the locals are looking around thinking, actually, maybe it's not quite so bad. And um, one of the things that uh, is, of course, in the town city centre um, is this church. And we get lots of people coming to the church, partly because they've seen... Um, seen something about it on Welcome to Wrexham, um, but also because when you arrive in Wrexham, it's right in the middle and it dominates the city centre. So uh, you can't walk around the um, um, around the town without actually seeing it. And uh, lots of people come in. And uh, so it's in it's increased footfall considerably. And uh, um, but it's interesting talking to people. So I'll say, you know, where are you from? And they'll say Montana. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where Montana is on the map. So, uh, um, you know, that might be a conversation we have with them. But uh, uh, And then they'll say something along the lines of, oh, we're doing really well in the league, aren't we? And who's we? Ah, right, yes, Wrexham. So I discovered that there are Wrexham supporters, um, as well as just uh, um, visitors, Wrexham supporters from across the world. So having a conversation with somebody from Montana about we are doing really well, like you said. It's a bit weird, but it's fun. That's great. Well, everybody seemed very happy and lively, and you had a lot of volunteers at the church, mm -hmm. and from our chat, you were saying that you run lots of groups. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so the church is very much at the centre of the community in all sorts of ways. So we have, um, myself, um, I'm pretty much the only paid member of staff. Uh, we have 100 volunteers, roughly from uh, the administrator from the people who uh, um, sit and welcome people in the church and uh, uh, chat to the visitors um, but uh, we do a whole load of other special special things as well so we have a, a community cafe um, in the winter it becomes a warm cafe a sort of warm space people can just come in and chat and um, about issues that are affecting them and um, it's really interesting sort of seeing who comes to that there's a core of people that um, sort of moves on from that into um, so sort of just whoever's around at the time uh, we do lots of activities for children so we have um, two children's groups uh, one for really little children called babes in the pew um, and we get about oh gosh 15 um, toddlers effectively to that uh, and then we also run a church club on a Monday evening and we get probably about 15 slightly older children to that as well. We're looking to start um, a children's choir in the autumn. So that'll be really interesting to see how that develops. And um, we also do things for older people as well. So we run community lunches, um, yeah, coffee mornings, lots and lots of things. There's always something going on in the church. And even when there isn't an activity as such or a group meeting, you know, there, there are lots of people around. It's a really buzzing and vibrant place. 
And um, yeah, we talked about mental health when we mm -hmm. were there and, you know, the effect with COVID lockdown mm -hmm. and how that infected the community and how you were playing a great role in counselling people. So do you want to tell us more about that? About what happened during COVID? Um, COVID, of course, was a massive shock for everybody. So... Um, in a sense, we've been trained for pretty much every eventuality, other than the eventuality that came along. I suppose that's uh, um, that's um, that's one of the things about about COVID. It took everybody off guard. So um, obviously, the church was closed for a while. I wasn't allowed even to set foot in the building uh, because it was considered to be unsafe or you know whatever it was. Do not go into your church. So um, my curate and I at the time decided that what we wanted to do was to bring the church to people. So we live streamed services on a Sunday and we also recorded uh, evening prayer every day of the week um, so that there was always something going out on Facebook and YouTube. Um, but while that was going on, I basically worked my way through the parish lists. And um, so we have lists of uh, names and addresses and work from one end to the other. Uh, pretty much in alphabetical order and had really in-depth conversations with people that I'd seen. I knew the faces, they knew me, um, but I was having really interesting conversations with people that I just hadn't spoken to before and found out lots of things about uh, about people. And that's been something really helpful so that when, we've, when we opened up, uh, I was seeing people with new eyes and uh, the church has grown since we've opened up and there are more people coming but um yeah it was really uh really fruitful time as well as being you know sort of pretty awful in all sorts of other ways but yeah so made the most of being trapped at home recording stuff and uh and just talking to people so spending pretty much all day on the phone yeah fabulous because you were definitely very warm and friendly when you met brian and i and so welcoming and um, you mentioned training. So in your training, do you do a lot of work with mental health? Because I know that's a big role mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, um, I personally did um, a reasonable amount of mental health training. So um, to some extent, training is tailored for people's interests and people's, um, people's skills. And um, I was sent on a mental health training course. So it was something called Clinical Pastoral Education. Um, to give it its uh, brand and formal title. But it basically involves spending a month in a psychiatric hospital on the ward and um, go in every day and sit there and talk to the patients, talk to uh, talk to them about what was going on. And um, to some extent, actually, it was coping with the boredom uh, because there's not an awful lot to do on a mental health ward. And uh, um, just having one of us around was, um, was actually quite fun for people so that they could talk to somebody who was new. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we had a debrief um, pretty much every afternoon with the, the, the hospital chaplain, who was a mental health expert. And we, we learned a huge amount about different mental illnesses, um, about the whole sort of um, gamut of um, things that people might, um, might suffer from and how you, how you treat them as well. So that was actually a really useful and intensive course. So that was two months, one month in a psychiatric hospital, and then I spent a month in a school for children with severe learning difficulties. Uh, and that's another aspect of mental health that um, to some extent I haven't really explored quite as much in my ministry. Um, but the things that I learned on the psychiatric ward um, are things that um, I continue to use today, yeah. Oh, fantastic. And I'm a former psychiatric nurse and a registered nurse and counsellor. So it's interesting that you're going because we did have a hospital chaplain that used to come around mm -hmm. um, most days. So um, what do you find is most effective for you when you're counselling people? What, what have been your best achievements? I think the most important thing is actually just listening to people, um, hearing what people have to say. Yeah, when we were chatting, a proud American wearing a Wrexham shirt came up and, mm -hmm. you know, asked you about mental health and um, said he had a friend with an issue and someone that was seeing ghosts. And I believe that's one of your fortes 
Yeah, so um, I'm a deliverance minister as well as doing this, obviously, and um, so um, and so deliverance ministry is really interesting. Um, it used to be called exorcism, um, but we don't actually do very much in the way of exorcism anymore, um, mainly because the um, you only do exorcism if somebody is demonstrably possessed, and uh, very few people are. But um, so, um, but I spend quite a lot of my time talking to people who um, are either experiencing some sort of paranormal activity or think they're experiencing some sort of paranormal activity. And one of the things that um, I need to do is to sort of work out again, what's going on. So the most common thing is that people uh, come to me and say, I'm hearing voices, I'm possessed. Um, yeah, and that happens surprisingly often. Uh, in my line of work. So I'm, I'm usually able to say, actually, you're, you know, I can pretty much guarantee you're not possessed. Uh, and sort of, well, why do you think I'm not possessed? Because you wouldn't be having this conversation with me. No self-respecting demon would allow you to go and talk to the deliverance minister if you were um, if you were genuinely possessed. Stands to reason, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. And, um, but also that, that sort of thing about if you're hearing voices, um, you really do need to go and see your doctor. Uh, you really need to go and see a medic. Um, you know, sort of, you know, do you have a diagnosis for anything? And then sometimes you discover that they'll have a diagnosis for schizophrenia, but they're not taking their tablets because they're not schizophrenic, they're possessed. And that becomes difficult. So that's sort of actually, if you're hearing voices, the chances are that it is your illness, not because you're possessed. And um, it can be, it can take quite a lot of um, persuasion, really, for them to sort of re-engage with the um, uh, with the mental health um, with the mental health teams. Um, sometimes it's quite easy. I, I've had conversations with people who said, um, um, "I'm hearing voices. Is it? Do you think it's my schizophrenia or I'm, I'm possessed? Then it's schizophrenia." Um, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really annoying because I haven't been taking my tablets and uh, my mental health, um, health team are going to be really, really cross with me. So in that case, I said, well, actually, you need to start taking your tablets and you need to fess up, um, you know, that this is um, that this is going on. Ah, thank, you know, thanks very much for the advice. And, and that was basically it. Wow. <laughs> and, so um... the case closed, but it doesn't always work that way. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, because a lot of people say they're hearing voices or a lot of people channel and things like that as well. So when that first happens, that could be pretty scary for them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it's, um, again, sort of working out what it is that's happening. Um, and, um, you know, as I said, the, um, you know, the assumption is that if you're, yeah, um, if you're hearing voices, you know, you, you, you need to really drill down into uh, what those, you know, what those issues are and also to some extent what the voices are saying. Can you tell us about your book, Deliverance, Everyday Investigations into Poltergeist, Ghosts and Other Supernatural Phenomena? Right, yes, the book. Um, I didn't want to write it, basically. Um, I was... Um, so traditionally, deliverance ministers don't make themselves known because they, um, I think the assumption is that you, you get pestered by all sorts of people um, who want to, um, you know, sort of want to um, ask your advice or will actually doorstep you just turn up. That's happened to me as well. Um, but um, so we tend to keep our, um, tend to keep a relatively low profile to the extent that most people don't know that uh, each diocese has a team of deliverance ministers, and that can be um, slightly problematic because lots of people have said since I've written the book, we didn't know that the church did any of this, and uh, quite clearly the church does because I've written about it. But what happened was that um, I went to a conference. A friend of mine is um, interested in both law and human rights and um, is, uh, is also ordained um, uh, uh, as a priest was wanting to explore the whole idea of uh, possession and legal rights and human rights. So the idea is that um, if you are possessed, genuinely possessed, uh, the demon will not want to be expelled 
So um, if a rite of exorcism is performed on you, it will be against your will. So, um, which may violate your human rights. So does the treatment um, of performing a religious ritual on you violate your human rights or not? It was a whole day conference on this and there were lots of people who were interested from um, lawyers to uh, um, some deliverance ministers as well who signed up for the, the day's conference. And um, so my friend had asked me to give a little talk about uh, what deliverance ministers do uh, on a daily basis, what sort of things we deal with, the different sort of cases that we might encounter, and uh, something about some of the legal aspects of, of it. So uh, insurance is one of the things that uh, um, she wanted me to talk about because uh, we need to be insured to, to do our jobs just in case something goes horribly wrong. So we have this conversation. And um, somebody put their hand at the back of the wall and said, have you ever had any interfaith involvement? And I thought about it for a moment and I said, yes, actually there was once uh, a Muslim family and um, they asked me to go out and talk to them because they thought they had seen the ghost of a Christian of a monk. Uh, it was a Christian monk and therefore um, they needed a Christian priest to sort themselves out. So I went along and it turned out that it was nothing of the sort and uh, nothing to see here and move on. So that was the end of uh, end of that conversation. There was some various other talks later on. Um, and then uh, a couple of months later, some of the journalists from the Sunday Times, the, you know, the um, big uh, big Sunday big Sunday newspaper in the UK, got in touch with me and said, "We've got this this story about you. Uh, it's um, you." were asked to perform an exorcism on a Muslim lady and you refused because you thought that she would be ritually sexually abused. Wow. Um, is this true? And, well, actually, uh, no, it's not. He said, so what did happen? I said, I don't really want to give an interview. He said, but we're going to publish the story about you anyway. Um, so you might as well tell me what did happen. So, uh, so I did, and then I realised that I had actually... Um, given an interview. So um, the following, uh, yeah, the following morning it was published. And uh, the day after, um, somebody from a literary agent got in touch with me and said, do you want to write a book about it? No, I don't. Well, why not? Because I don't want my name out there. And uh, they said, well, actually, you're on page three of the Sunday Times. This morning, you're on page one of the Sun tabloid newspaper, uh, one of the Murdoch newspapers, you're on um, page one of the Daily Mail and uh, the Daily Star, you are everywhere, everyone knows your name, you might as well write a book about it. So um, I talked to my bishop, uh, who was quite supportive, and um, so what the book is trying to do is to explain in a, in a very undramatic way what we do, because what we do isn't terribly dramatic, nothing ever happens while we're there. And uh, those things that we deal with, poltergeists um, and uh, hauntings and ghosts and that sort of thing, uh, as well as some of the some of the mental health and the uh, um, you know the sort of exorcism aspect, they're all in the book and all explained. You know what we do and what people like me, um, what to expect if somebody like me comes along. But also, I hope to point people in the direction of somebody who can actually help them. Right, because that's quite reassuring to hear because most people, when you talk about exorcisms, you just think of that movie that was out years ago and, know. you know, can be quite scary. Yes, yes, The Exorcist. Um, somebody asked me once, um, oh gosh, how long an exorcism would take? Uh, and I said, well, it depends on whether you have a cup of tea afterwards. He said, oh. really? I said, well, I said, if you have a cup of tea, it'll take me yeah, about half an hour. Um, if, you, if you're actually doing one. But we only perform exorcisms if it looks like somebody is possessed. Uh, and the symptoms of possession are so extreme and so rare that it almost never happens. Um, symptoms of possession are um, classically that um, they will know something about you that they can use to throw you off, uh, throw you off balance or to damage you in some way. So, um, you know, sort of a secret about you or, um, you know, so these days, you know, you, you've got a gambling addiction or whatever it happens to be. Um, so that's that's one of the things that um, that might point you in the direction of somebody who's possessed. The uh, other things are 
preternatural strength that somebody will, you know, little old lady will throw a dining room table at you uh, while quoting the content of your internet browser history. Um, and um, the third thing is that um, there will usually be um, an expectation that they'll be able to speak a language that they've never studied. So there are cases of people who've gone out and there was um, uh, a little old lady who lived in a rural part of um, a rural part of England, never left, never left the village really, um, but could speak um, classical Arabic. And um, so they thought that there, there, there might be something a bit, a bit odd about that. Um, but, uh, but it's basically those three symptoms. And um, ideally, ideally, you're looking for all three, but they're all pretty extreme and difficult to fake, to be honest. Uh, people do occasionally have a go. And I've had described in my book a um, conversation I had with somebody with, uh, um, that was desperately trying to fake um, this. And it was, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really odd, odd encounter. Why would you want somebody to exorcise you? Mm. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, and um, yes, um, actually just answering my own question. Um, I suspect that if you have a diagnosis for mental health, uh, for a mental health issue, um, exorcism is, looks like it's going to be a quick, quick fix. So a single zap, whereas, um, you know, sort of a lifetime of taking tablets or a long time of taking tablets um, that make you feel pretty grotty. Um, I can see why you might think, you know, this is worth a go. Fair enough, work. I can... Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. So, so, so you still have to take the tablets eventually, but uh, uh, but you might actually find, um, you know, sort of find an exorcist somewhere, sometimes online, who will perform an exorcism. Mm. As I said, it doesn't work because if it's a mental health issue, it won't respond to being driven out. Wow, so... Your work is very varied, from as it's my work, yes. <laughs> yeah, and did you always um, want to be a priest? And are there other family members priests? Right, um, there are, there are no other family members, but uh, it's it's something that I've always felt that I um, that I was called to. So um, I grew up going to church. Um, I sang in the church choir, and uh, when I was a boy, and um, had a sort of um, so it was a slightly weird encounter, really. Um, once I was um, sitting in a place called Walsingham, where there's um, a, a shrine and a Christian shrine um, of uh, Our Lady of Walsingham, uh, and I remember sitting there in this um, in, in the central part of the shrine, and just this sort of feeling that there was somebody standing behind me with his, and it was a him, hand on my shoulder, and um, just sort of felt warm and loved and. That sort of feelings stayed with me for a long time. This feeling of actually being being held somehow in God's love, um, and um, for me, being a priest was a, the the piece of the jigsaw that was missing. So when I was ordained, it felt like that bit of my life was complete. That bit of my story was complete. And um, as again, as I've moved moved on, different things have come along that have been another piece of the jigsaw. So um, being here, um, just walking into this amazing building um, was um, part, of, part of that jigsaw and it felt exactly right, uh, quite amazing. Um, uh, and then I had, the, uh, um, uh, I had the interview and uh, fortunately I got the job, um, but it was that sort of, um, <laughs> but it just felt, felt completely right to be here and uh, you know, in this place at this time. Wow. Um, yeah, after we seen you, we actually went to um, St. David's Cathedral and wow. I mm. I had an incredible experience there and mm. I saw this vision and I, like you, just felt the love of God and it was, you know, it's very hard to describe it when, when something mm. like that happens and just seeing a vision and it was in the Mass and... Mm. I'd seen a sign for um, a choir singing and we didn't realise we were going to the mass and then we just sat there and I closed my eyes and just, it was just incredible. Wow. Um, 
And so, and St David's is an amazing place. It's one of those places where you sort of um, you 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 walk in. It's in a bowl, isn't it? You you walk down the yeah. hill. You walk through a gateway, and you're in a almost in a different world. Um, yes. And uh, um, a fr friend of mine is the dean of St David's, and she was saying that um, uh, she she was talking about the COVID lockdown, and she said that it was amazing living there during the COVID lockdown, and that sense of almost being protected. It was. Uh, she said it was uh, it was a really special place to be at that time. Um, tough mm -hmm. as it was because they couldn't leave, but uh, but they they were all sort of felt that they were somewhere somewhere safe. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, our trip, it wasn't intentional to go to so many churches, cathedrals and <laughs> sacred places. But uh, also, once we finished our trip of Wales, we went to um, England and we ended up in Wales. And wow. We went to the cathedral there. And I thought about you instantly because as you walked in, you just could see thousands of the dove um, origamis hanging mm. from the ceilings. Yes. And part of our conversation, you said um, one of the COVID projects, um, a lot of the congregation had actually made um, angels. That's um, right. Yeah. They, um, do you want to tell us about that? Yeah. So um, we reckoned that, oh uh, gosh, um, 6,000 people had died in Wales of the COVID uh, pandemic mm -hmm. in, the, in the first phase. And so we wanted to commemorate this in some way in the church. Um, so um, some of my parishioners made angels. There was a curtain of angels hanging at the back of the church, which was really quite quite amazing. And um, uh, people would just stop and look at it. But more amazing than that was the way that um, people suspended nets uh, down the yeah. church. And uh, we had literally as I said, thousands of angels uh, that were made out of pieces of paper. Um, somebody learned how to, um, you know, how to, um, bold pieces of paper to make them make uh, make them into an angel shape and sat there. You know, there, you know, there, there were teams of people doing this, and so um, so when you walked in, there was just this sort of um, choir of angels just sort of suspended. You know, sort of all the way um, all the way uh, down the church. It was the, really the most amazing thing. But also people's reaction to it was amazing. So people would come in and they'd sit under the angels and they'd just be quiet uh, and um, just sort of sit and think and well, pray, I suppose. Uh, and it was it was really, really very moving and uh, one of the most special things that's happened, you know, since I've been here. Yeah. Fabulous. And um, you mentioned that you had to apply for that job and go for an interview. Mm. I didn't realise that would have happened in your profession, for the want of a better word. <laughs> and um, can you also discuss the transition from being a vicar at St Giles to becoming the Dean of Llandaff Cathedral? Right. So, yes. Uh, so I've been here for nine, um, nine and a bit years, nine, nine years and a couple of months. And um, so that was a slightly weird transition, really. Uh, most of the time, jobs are advertised um, pretty much like they are in the secular world. Um, so, um, you know, you, you'd, you'd get a job advert, you'd apply. Uh, there would be sometimes a two day uh, interview process and then, you know, um, uh, somebody gets appointed out of that. In this case, this was uh, simply the bishop ringing me up and saying, uh, my dean is just about to retire. Um, I'd like you to, um, you know, I'd like you to come along. Uh, and it was as simple as that. Um, but the bishop is somebody that I'd known and worked with here. She, she was, um, she was my colleague when I first came here. And um, it was. Um, there were also special circumstances why she wanted somebody, wanted to appoint somebody really quickly rather than going through a long appointment process. But. Simply, she said, okay, you, you know, actually, I think that you're the right person with the right skill set just at the moment, and I'd like you to come along. So, so that's what, um, that's what's happening, really. Wow, that's amazing. And um, going back to you not wanting to be famous, um, as we've been traveling and talking about Wrexham, everybody's like, wow. And of course, everybody knows you and knows of the church. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
can you tell us because you've been on on the show mm -hmm. can you tell us how how that came about okay so um it came about because well St Giles is the thing that you see when when you come to Wrexham. So fairly early on, film crews started to sort of turn up and sort of wander around, and um, you know, sort of want want to have chats with people. Uh, sometimes they got the cameras on, sometimes they didn't. And um, but um, what what really kicked things off for me was when Rob and Ryan. Um, uh, Rob McElhenney and Ryan Reynolds uh, turned up in town and they had this grand tour. It was like a royal visit. Um, so they um, so they went round the town as it then was and they, they came came here. But it was right at the very end of the COVID pandemic. In fact, it was um, the day that we were putting the angels up. So there's a really nice, uh, nice photo of uh, Ryan Reynolds standing at the door of the church, looking down into the church. But uh, their security team decided that um, for, you know, uh, COVID health reasons, uh, they weren't allowed into the church. Um, but um, um, so they, they they came in, there was, um, you know, sort of a couple of shots, they um, shot at me greeting them sort of at the door. Uh, and then, um, you know, they, they had a tour. Um, somebody else was showing them around the town, a uh, guy called Spencer, who was um, heavily involved in the, in the football club. So he was, he, he was there, he was their tour guide. Um, and then um, the film crew wandered off and they were doing something else. And Rob and Ryan were looking at the, um, were looking at the memorial plaques. And um, so they, 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 they were obviously talking to one another about the, um, you know, sort of what these were. Um, and I went up to them and explained what they were, um, that they were the cremated remains plots. Uh, and um, so we were, um, got talking actually. Uh, and then Spencer said, actually, Jason's written a book about, um, um, so it's a slightly weird thing that he does about so the deliverance ministry exorcism. And at that point, the cameras had turned around and they, they were filming this. So um, so once again, the whole thing started. Um, and uh, But it was really nice having that. So, so, so it was effectively a private conversation. But then suddenly the cameras had turned around and, OK, maybe there's something more interesting to film uh, than what they're filming. They, they were filming the crowds um, screaming outside, you lie and we love you, why and we love you. Uh, what what Ron, Ron Mac Michael Henry thought about the whole thing, because nobody was saying, Rob, we love you. Um, so, um, <laughs> but it, it, it was, um, so it was quite relaxed. It was quite, you know, it was quite gentle in that way. Yeah. Wow. I just think it's phenomenal. And every, anybody you talk to, if they watch the series, mm -hmm. like for us, we were at a St. David's Day event in Canberra oh, with nice. the, yeah, with the Welsh, um, Welsh Australian Association yeah. there. And um, the opening speech by the president was, you know, the talk about welcome to Wrexham. And I'm not a football follower. And, you know, we were talking later um, mm. to a guy in uh, one of the members and um, Paul Welsh. And he actually was living in, grew up in Wrexham. Mm -hmm. And when he was 11 to the age of 21, he was working on the turnstiles. Wow. And then last year he'd gone back and was there for some of the promotions, got to go to three of the games. And, and well, yeah. he's like... When you think about it, it's a small mining town and it was, you know, more or less very run down and nobody really heard about it. But now everybody says, you know, if you mention Wales, oh, are you from Wrexham? And yes, yeah, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's 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 um, yeah, it's been really interesting. So uh, going to um, a couple of months ago, we went to London, my, my son's a stage manager. And uh, we were uh, we sort of catching taxis around London, um, and we uh, we were talking to sort of several taxi drivers. Where are you from? Uh, we're from Wales, blank North Wales, blank Wrexham. Oh yes, blah 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 blah. <laughs> and they they've all heard of it, and so, suddenly it's it's got this sort of place recognition. Um, so I'm I'm moving from here to Plandaff in in Cardiff, and uh, so um, so previously you would say. So, you know, I'm from Wales, are you from Cardiff? Uh, I'm from Wales, are you from Wrexham? 
<laughs> so, 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 so that's been a sort of um yeah uh, yeah a bit of a turnaround and uh, um yeah some of the locals here are saying yeah finally yes because they're, they're, there's a great rivalry between north and south um yeah but, uh, but it's a you know it's a it's good natured rivalry but it's just one of those that sort of, yeah actually finally you know sort of something that's going to north wales rather than all going to south wales despite the fact i'm i myself going south <laughs> yeah and um Besides the football club, I really didn't expect that emotionally that Robin Ryan would be so involved with the team, mm. plus the whole town, you know, they love being there and they've started loads of projects, I believe, there as well. Yeah, so 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 there are, um, yeah, um, you know, there, there was a little park um, that they've, um, you know, that they sponsored. Um, a lot of it is um, sort of small things or um, sort of things for individuals. So, so if there's, um, you know, there was sort of um, uh, locals needing medical treatment or, um, you know, something like that, you'll very often find that they will pitch in and do that. And, uh, but they do seem to be interested in the town as a community or city, uh, sorry, as it now is, like it became a city last year, mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, it's um, you know, but they seem to be interested in Wrexham as a community, uh, as well as just as um, a commercial venture. Um, because the cynics might say, well, actually, the whole part of the exercise is to sort of put lots of money into a football team, and uh, the further it gets the leagues, and that's where it's going, the more it's worth, and then you can sell it at a profit. And uh, but they do seem to be putting their money where their mouth is, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And like you say, it's good for the whole morale of the mm. town. And yeah. like we went um, after we seen you, we went, walked through the town, you know, past mm. the cafe and, you know, we ended up in the pub. And it was hilarious because um, lots of the locals were showing tourists around the pub and talking about the oh. the history and different things. So, yes. yeah. And we were told that busloads of tourists you know americans canada all around mm. the world will go go to the city so i think it's um great yeah. for the economy as well so yeah yeah so um so the the uh, the pub the turf uh which is actually in the football ground it's uh, uh i think the only um only pub in britain that's actually built into the football ground um so it's uh yeah um yeah they get loads of people the uh uh the the uh shop uh for, for the football team is just around the corner um so yeah. but it's um you know so the, the locals just like what are you going to be doing uh, oh yeah yeah yes that's uh um and uh it's yeah it's it's fun and it's interesting and it's um it's sort of exciting actually yeah um so as i said i've been here nine years and um it's uh, it's changed a lot and it's a lot more self-confident and um uh, yeah a lot more fun in all sorts of ways <laughs> right so um so you're going to flandas mm -hmm. cathedral which is also an incredible iconic um cathedral mm -hmm. so how do you see the transition and your role there Okay, so yeah, it's um, it's a much much bigger operation. So here, as I said, it's basically me and a hundred volunteers. Uh, Flandaf has um, three full time clergy, uh, and there are other clergy around who um, you know who help out. Uh, and then there's a you know sort of music department. So so there are two uh, two full time musicians, and then there are. And then there's the office staff as well. So there, there are, you know, sort of uh, three or four people who work in the office full time. Um, so it's a much bigger operation. Um, found out to some extent is um, it's the place because it's the cathedral in Cardiff and Cardiff is the capital of Wales. Uh, it's the place where a lot of national things happen. Um, so if there's a national service of remembrance or commemoration or celebration, it'll happen in Llanaf. Um and um, so, um, so you've got that sort of big operation stuff. Um, and daily, um, there are, you know, sort of daily services now. There are three services uh, every day, and they all need to be staffed, of course. Um, and um, so my job is to basically oversee 
um, the whole thing, uh, and also to work to support the bishop in the diocese because that's that, that, that's also part of the role. So some of it's the same. Um, so I'll still be taking services, and uh, um, but I will be sharing taking the services much more than I am here. Uh, most of the time, it's um, it's myself or my uh, my um, my well, effectively volunteer colleague. Uh, taking services, so I do the lion's share, whereas there, uh, you know, it'll be much more, much more equ equitably split. Um, but I'll also spend a lot, lot more time in the office, and um, um, but also I suspect sort of meeting people on a national level rather than a, a local level like I do here. Wow. Well, I'd like to mm. wish you all the very best for your future endeavours, and I'm sure you'll be very successful. Thank and, you. Yes, and thank you so much for um, giving up your precious time and sharing your wonderful words of wisdom. I'm sure the listeners will really enjoy it. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Good. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good to speak to you, Beverly.